will see next week, honesty, confession, and being known are important markers on this journey towards wholeheartedness. So let me be honest with you. This is my favorite credit card. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that in Christian circles. You know, the slave is borrowed to the lender and all that, but just having this thing in my pocket gives me confidence, knowing that if a need arises, this guy will come through for me. Or if there's something we really want, my wife and I don't really want to spend the money from our weekly budget, we can make it happen. Even if we don't pull the trigger, we could. When this card is in my pocket, I know that I'm going to be okay. I have what I need. I'm safe and secure. And that's a feeling that we're all chasing. A sense of well-being that we're meant to discover as we live wholehearted lives. And what does it mean to be wholehearted? That's what this journey is about. It's what we've been talking about. So let's go back to our foundation, the story arc of the Bible, the greatest commandment, and the second one like it. Wholeheartedness is about human hearts that are connected to God and others, loving God with our whole being, abiding in his love, and reflecting his goodness and character to the world around us. But what happens when that approach doesn't seem to be getting the results that we want? What happens when we feel like we're not getting what we need? When we feel like we don't have enough or that we are enough, where do you turn when you feel insecure? The world has a lot of suggestions, offers of safety and security, suggested paths of abundance and significance. Give your attention to this pursuit, to this goal, and you will have enough. You will be enough. Focus here and take control of the things that seem to be escaping you. And that invitation is the real driving force behind something the Bible calls idolatry. What is idolatry? Well, in the Old Testament, idol worship is pretty easy to define. God gave his people an explicit commandment not to worship other gods or to make other idols. I mean, it's the leading commandment in the Big Ten. God says through Moses, I am the Lord God. Uh, the Lord, when it's all caps, is uh, the word Yahweh in Hebrew. It's God's personal name. I am the Lord God. I rescued you out of the land of slavery. So one, have no other gods before me. And two, whatever you do, do not worship statues. Pretty simple, right? But for some reason, the Hebrew people just couldn't help themselves. It's a, it's a major theme in the Jewish scriptures. They'd get it right for a generation, but eventually they just slip back into idolatry, to idol worship. Why is that? I mean, if you're, if you're going to worship a deity, why not just worship the one true God who spoke everything into being, who rescued your people out of the land of slavery and called you his own possession? Why worship a different God? Especially when worship involves sacrifice of some kind. Was it just the thing to do? Was it uncool to worship Yahweh? Were these other gods more permissive? What was it? Well, it really comes down to a question of safety and security. You may or may not know that these other gods in question were not just rivals to Yahweh. The gods worshipped by other nations were generally associated with some aspect of nature or a space. So, the god of the sun, or the moon, or the weather, or a particular land area, or even a city. Or in a more personal sense, uh, the god of health and vitality or fertility. These gods had names, and people made statues as images or idols of these gods. Now, now think about this. For a culture that was dependent on nature for its livelihood, good weather, good land, good health are all very important factors that are out of your control. Very important for safety and security. But what if you heard through the grapevine that there was a temple where you could go? Maybe offer some grain, sacrifice an animal to the priests or the shrine prostitutes and the God of, of that temple would look favorably on your land. Or maybe if you and your wife were struggling uh, with fertility, make a sacrifice to the God of that temple and you would be promised children. Well, the God of the Bible, the creator of the universe, who is near to the brokenhearted, is always waiting for people to seek him and trust that what he provides will be enough. But there's always a pull, isn't there? The pull that God's people felt to worship other gods is really no different than the things that you and I look to when we feel insecure. Like when things aren't going our way, or we don't feel like we have enough, or things are out of our control, we start to panic, and in our desperation we scramble to find something or someone that we think will give us what we need. 
so that we feel safe and secure again. And it's for that reason that the Apostle Paul calls, calls greed or covetousness idolatry in Colossians 3.5. Think about it. Greed is a God of the heart that says, get more, get what they have. Keep up with the Joneses, do whatever it takes, and then you'll be satisfied. Then you will feel safe and secure. You won't have enough until you get the next thing. That's really what Jesus is getting at when he says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Is God calling money evil? Not really. Money is a bad God. If you serve it, it will leave you less than wholehearted. Meanwhile, the God who made us in his image and created the sun, moon, and stars and the land and the sea, who holds the whole world in his hand, says, look to me, trust me, walk with me, love me with your whole heart, and learn what it means to fill the earth with good things. Do that and you will have enough. Not everything you want, not everything you think you need, but enough to be who I made you to be, to love others well, to bring good into the world, in the place and time in which you live. So as it turns out, idolatry isn't just about statues. It's about the multitude of things that we give our hearts to rather than loving God with our whole heart and reflecting his goodness and character in the way we engage the world around us. In our, safe, uh, in our, in our search for safety and security, we might give a big chunk of our heart to a career path, even if it means being less than honest or taking advantage of others, even if it means sacrificing health or sacrificing family in the process. A good career is a good thing. It just makes for a bad God. And if you give your heart to it, it might leave you feeling less than wholehearted. Or in our search for significance, maybe we give a big chunk of our heart to our social media feed. Again, not necessarily a bad thing, but say that this carefully curated online image is less than honest, or maybe it keeps you from loving others well, or from seeing the needs of those God has called you to love and care for, the friends and family in your life, or, or maybe your church or small group. Maybe rather than making time for scripture and prayer in the morning, like you really want to, you find yourself just scrolling, and you forget to seek first the kingdom of God, as Jesus says. Social media isn't a bad thing. But if you let it, let it take over part of your heart, you might end up feeling less than wholehearted. Or sometimes in our attempts for uh, our attempt to control outcomes that seem to be escaping us, we might turn to diet and exercise or information and news or medicine. And all those things are fine pursuits, but if we let them take over part of our heart, they tend to disappoint and leave us feeling less than wholehearted. In our search for well-being, maybe we just consume content like podcasts or we binge watch TV shows. Like, by the way, when did binging anything become acceptable behavior? We escape to numb ourselves to things we can't control. The good art and good music, good stories are good and beautiful things that we were created to share and tell, but they make bad gods. And when you think about it, anything can become an idol when we seek those things in and of themselves. Like Paul describes in Romans chapter 1, we worship created things rather than the creator. So do work, art, community, productivity, health, or information always bring division in our heart? No, not, not at all. When we love God with our whole heart and reflect his goodness and character to the world around us, as we abide in his love and learn to love our neighbor as ourselves, everything kind of falls into place. We honor God in the way that we work, in the way that we love and care, in the way that we rest, in the way that we connect, in the way that we create, in the way that we celebrate. We do those things wholeheartedly out of our love for God and in response to his love for us. The New Testament has some great reminders for us here, like Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Or 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 5. Everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God and prayer. 
Or like Jesus says in Matthew 6.33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to you as well. Or how about this prayer from our trusted heart guide, David, the man after God's own heart. Psalm 86.11 Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Fear has a way of creating insecurity that causes us to do things that we know aren't good for us. But when we fear God alone, when we have a loving reverence for him, everything else we really need comes in due time. So how about it? As you think about these rival gods of the heart, what are some things that you look to for safety and security, for significance or control? They might be good things. They might leave you less than feeling wholehearted when we seek them in and of themselves. So let's talk about some of those things as we start this next leg of our journey towards wholeheartedness.